General Alfred Terry may have been upset with Major Reno disobeying his orders, but in doing so, Reno had provided valuable information that required Terry to alter his operational plan. Prior to Reno's return, Terry was planning to have Gibbon's column march along the Rosebud. Custer would move upstream along the Tongue River, cross over to the Rosebud in the area of the Big Bend, which, as we saw in prior videos, was the site of the Sioux's surprise attack and repulse of General Crook's column. Terry's intelligence would now have the Indian village assumed to be along the Little Bighorn River. Therefore, Terry would have Gibbon march west along the Yellowstone, utilize the steamer the far west to cross over to the south bank and march upstream along the Bighorn River and establish a blocking position at the confluence with the Little Bighorn. This was to be done by the 26th of June. Custer, for his part, would move along the Rosebud and cross over to the headwaters of the Little Bighorn, driving all before him. On June 21st, Terry called a council of war aboard the Far West. He was to brief the officers of his plan, with Custer as the hammer and Gibbon as the anvil. During the conference aboard the Far West, Colonel Brisbane offered Custer his four companies of the 2nd Cavalry, which was part of Gibbon's force. Custer brushed the offer aside and stated something to the effect that the 7th could whip whatever it faced by itself. Brisbane seems to have viewed the response as an insult, and he would later describe Custer as an insufferable ass. Custer also declined to take the Gatling guns, probably because of the recent troubles Reno had with them during his scout. Terry assigned another mission to Custer, and that was to have the civilian scout, George Herondine, reconnoiter Tullock's Creek and report back to General Terry. By doing so, Herondeen would collect the handsome sum of $200. The command assumed that they would be facing as many as 1,500 warriors. It also lacked any recent information about General Crook. June 22nd was the day for the 7th Cavalry to start its move south. Each man would carry 100 rounds of carbine ammunition and 12 pounds of oats for his horse. 15 days of rations and 50 rounds of ammo extra per man were loaded in the pack train of some 175 mules. In Terry's written order to Custer, which we will dig into later, Custer copied an excerpt to Libby in his last letter to her. Augmenting the several dozen Arikara scouts with the 7th Cavalry would be the interpreter, Mitch Boyer, and the six best Crow scouts from Gibbon's command. They knew the land well and were highly motivated as their mortal enemy, the Sioux, were likely located on Crow land. Led by the Arikaras, the 7th Cavalry moved out, passing in review by General Terry and his staff. As the procession ended, Custer shook hands with Terry and turned to gallop away. John Gibbon shouted, Now, Custer, don't be greedy, but wait for us. Custer grinningly replied, No, I will not. Custer rode at the head of 31 officers, almost 600 enlisted men, over 40 scouts and guides, along with a number of civilians in various capacities. If you want a full understanding of the composition of the 7th Cavalry, I encourage you to visit the dashboard I built using the data from the Friends of the Little Bighorn Association. I converted the downloadable PDF file they have on their site into raw data. You can even download that raw data, should you so desire, to conduct your own analysis. Okay, well, the 7th moved upstream some 12 miles that first day, guide and interpreter Fred Gerard waited on board the far west to collect dispatches from Terry to be sent back to the Powder River Depot. Gerard claimed in an interview, 
that Terry remarked to his adjutant, Custer is happy now, off with a roving command of 15 days. I told him if he found any Indians not to do as Reno did, but if he thought he could whip them to do so. The next day on June 23rd, the column continued to march south, with Captain Benteen assigned three companies to protect and assist the pack train, which was causing all sorts of problems in slowing the advance. A few hours' march brought them to a deserted village site. Custer, calling a halt, remarked to Lieutenant Varnum, the chief of scouts, Here's where Reno made the mistake of his life. He had six troops of cavalry and rations enough for a number of days. He'd have made a name for himself if he'd pushed on after them. The 24th of June is a day where things begin to happen now at a rapid pace. Once underway, Custer mentioned to Herondine that it was time for him to move out on his recon of Tullock's Creek. However, Herondine consulted with Mitch Boyer, and they convinced Custer that it was too early to get that mission underway. Later that morning, they came to the site of Sitting Bull's Sundance. The scouts examined the signs, and they informed Custer that the enemy's medicine was strong and that they would win a great battle over the soldiers. However, as he moved on, Custer had other concerns. Scouting reports had reached him stating a large trail diverged from the Rosebud some 10 miles back. He ordered Varnum to ride back with some Arikra and investigate. Varnum must have been grinding his teeth, wondering why he had been sent back to do work his very capable scouts had already completed. Indeed, that diverging trail was found to reconverge back with the main trail. In the meantime, the Crow Scouts had returned about 1,600 hours, with word that the trail turned west about 12 miles ahead. The prey was close and the march resumed with Custer establishing camp near modern-day Busby, Montana, before sunset. Interestingly enough, during that portion of the march, Herondine approached Custer and mentioned that they were at the best point to begin the recon of Tullock's Creek. Custer said nothing, so Herondine simply returned to the column. Once in camp, Custer met with the Crow Scouts, who advised him the main trail heading west along Davis Creek crossed over the divide, and headed toward the lower reaches of the Little Bighorn, and also of a high hill the crows knew about, with good concealment from where they would be able to see into the valley of the Little Bighorn the next morning. Recall that Terry's instructions to Custer had him moving south along the Rosebud and to cross over to reach the upper Little Bighorn. Of course, Custer took full advantage of the discretionary part of his orders and decided to move west in direct pursuit. This was vintage Custer. His first great disobeying of orders occurred on July 3, 1863 at Gettysburg and led to a decisive Union cavalry victory over Jeb Stuart. It was time for him to seize the initiative once again. One must also ponder the reaction of the Crow Scouts if he had marched away from the trail down the Rosebud. They had been disappointed by what they saw as General Gibbon's timidity back in May and as a result were more to happy to join with Custer because they thought he would fight. Custer's first move was to dispatch the intrepid Varnum and several Crow Scouts to move to the observation point near the Divide, the so-called Crow's Nest. Then he sent word of officer's call. Shortly after Varnum and the Crows departed, which was just shy of 2130 hours, Custer advised the officers of his intention to move out at 2,300 hours, conduct a night march, hide the command during the day, conduct reconnaissance, and attack the following morning, June 26. Around 2,300 hours, the regiment stepped off with the Crow leader Half Yellow Face acting as guide in the now moonless dark. It was a difficult march with men banging cups and calling out to help each other on the trail. Of course, the pack train proved problematic. Captain Keogh and his eye company were the escort for the train, and Keogh's loud cursing of the animals and packers was heard by many. Well, after about three hours, the command begins arriving at the area referred to as Halt 1, some six and a half miles from the starting point. At roughly the same time, Varnum and the scouts arrive in the low area of the crow's nest. At sunrise, Varnum climbed to the top of the ridge where the crows informed him that they had saw signs of a large village with columns of smoke 
and a large pony herd. Dry as he might, the trail-weary Varnum could not make anything out. He did have the presence of mind to know that if the scout saw it, then it was probably there. He scribbled a note for Custer, gave it to the Arikara's Red Star and Bull, who quickly departed. To their amazement, they could easily make out the regiment's location because of the morning fires to brew coffee. Meanwhile, on the banks of the Little Bighorn, Sitting Bull had returned to camp with his nephew One Bull after praying and offering gifts to Wakantanka. That night, the Cheyenne and Sioux chiefs met in council. They decided to not ride out to meet any blue coats that might approach. But if the blue coats attacked, they would meet and defeat them. <laughs> 